NASA's Armstrong Flight Research Center has been at the forefront of aerospace since its inception in 1946. The value of using subscale aircraft for research became apparent very quickly. While the nature of flight test carries with it certain challenges, including expense, as well as risk to pilots and aircraft, engineers are able to test new designs in a relatively short amount of time and for comparatively little cost and reduced risk through the use of subscale models. This was unique in flight test at the time. Dale Reed came to NASA's predecessor organization, the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics, in 1953 as a young aeronautical engineer. On his own time, Reed was a model aviation hobbyist with considerable experience designing, building, and flying radio-controlled aircraft. He advocated the use of the simpler model aircraft for flight test built largely from off-the-shelf parts. His early tests paved the way for the center's scaled aircraft flight test operation. This uh, shape that's behind me here, the M2F1, uh, was derived from a series of wind tunnel tests that were done early in the space program. I, uh, come up with a proposal that maybe we could fly a low-cost uh, version of this, uh, of a lifting body. And as a result of this, I did some, uh, some sketches, some design work, and I also built a flying model. I felt that we ought to do a flight demonstration out here at uh, uh, here at NASA at Edwards, uh, California, so that decision makers uh, on future spacecraft could have a confidence level to make good decisions whether to use this kind of a, a vehicle or some other shape. And beginning to uh, flare out the uh, vehicle, pitch the nose up. Main gear touchdown. Space Shuttle Atlantis is rolling out on runway 22 at Edwards Air Force Base, completing 190. Why not come back from space in style rather than being rescued? As models became more accepted in NASA's flight test regime, their use grew. Designers and builders still used off-the-shelf equipment, which allowed for quick repairs. And you didn't lose a lot. If you crashed that little wooden model, well, you're not out much, and the aerodynamic principles are the same. They're just scaled down. But model airplanes' growing acceptance allowed forward-thinking, unique configurations that increased in complexity. Often, tests were simple with rudimentary instrumentation, or even none at all, leaving just photo and film to record and analyze. Even with such low-tech methods, the results were valuable. You can prove an idea on a really small scale, and if that idea doesn't work, you get immediate feedback. And you can really do the fly, fix, fly on a, on a, on a scale that way. That's the value it brings, so we don't end up having to put huge amounts of, of NASA resources, people, and money at risk uh, for an unproven idea. So it's really maturing those ideas. The Mini Sniffer, for example, a small remotely piloted aircraft, was investigated as an upper atmosphere research tool. Three total of these aircraft with varying shapes were built and flown. Utilizing a unique hydrazine-fueled power plant, 
Mini Sniffer 3 reached 20,000 feet in altitude, taking atmospheric samples. Back in the M2 days, we were talking about uh, just aerodynamics, just the shape of the airplane, the shape of the wing, all that, just pure mechanical aerodynamics. Nowadays, uh, we're looking at all, all kinds of electronic systems and miniaturization and autopilot systems and autonomy and AI and all those things are now uh, in the mix. The Model Lab, as it has become known, continues to provide unique capabilities and solutions to often challenging problems. But the best part of the day is when somebody comes in with a random question or an idea and a light bulb goes off and we say, yeah, we can absolutely do that. We maintain a fleet of around 20 vehicles and any one time there's a half a dozen to a dozen that are airworthy. So when, when a researcher comes to us with a problem or an idea, uh, first we identify, is it feasible? And then we look at the existing platforms that we have and is, do we have something that will already do the job that can be modified and integrated in such a way to, to achieve their goal. So we try to do everything that we can uh, in-house. So that means CNC machining on, on a smaller scale, laser cutting, water jetting, full composite capability all the way down to typical traditional stick and tissue type modeling. And that's one of the things I'm most proud of. We're a very well-rounded organization uh, that can take an idea from concept all the way through flight. And uh, I get to be every part of that. I get to be the guy that designs the aircraft and integrates it and then ultimately gets to fly it. It's intensely rewarding and something I look forward to every day. Now, we're very similar to full-scale test pilots in that we follow all the same processes and procedures. The major difference is, though, we can't feel anything. So our, our backside is not telling us anything. It's all by sight only. So you develop a certain feel uh, through your thumbs and the sticks to what the aircraft is doing, and it's a, a very different sort of a skill set than you would find in a, a traditional piloted aircraft. So by not having a pilot on board, we're able to try things in a more accelerated manner or with less oversight than you might otherwise have in a piloted aircraft. So nobody ever wants to crash an yep. aircraft and we certainly yep. do everything possible to not do that, but it does right. happen once in a while because you're trying things that have never been done before. And we like to say fail forward and the next time you learn from that and move on. A great example of how we deal with a mishap is our HQ-90 aircraft. All right, everybody ready? Good, ready. There's a bit of Julia. Yeah. Bail board one. Yeah. All right, so have you given the takeoff command there? Yeah, some place. You go ahead. They put slot mail. Slot mail is slot dark. Okay, take it off. Three, two, one, here we go. HQ-90 is a vehicle that we use for advanced uh, aircraft collision avoidance system. So it's a vertical takeoff aircraft that transitions to horizontal wingborne flight. And it's intended to be used for seeing and avoiding other airborne aircraft. Uh, during one of our tests, uh, we had a uh, lift propulsor motor failure that resulted in a hard landing. Fortunately, um, very little damage to the aircraft. We returned to flight relatively quickly, but more importantly than that is we were able to dig in to the system and have a better understanding of how and why that happened and prevent it from happening in the future. Subscale aircraft have nearly no limit to the research that can be accomplished. Modern guidance systems and payloads are able to provide immense amounts of data in real time. Missions that are considered far too dangerous for a piloted aircraft can be flown with little fear of human risk. The Automatic Ground Collision Avoidance System, or Auto GCAS, is one such example. Fly up straight, terminate. There's no way that uh, the pilot could um, get himself into a situation where uh, the performance of the aircraft would, uh, would not be able to get out if the algorithm uh, did not work as uh, planned. So we couldn't risk human life and it made sense that this should be an unmanned aircraft. 
Controlled flight into terrain, or CFIT, is when an airworthy, actively piloted aircraft unintentionally flies into the ground. To combat this, the United States Air Force and NASA work together to find a solution. Engineers developed a unique algorithm that would allow a world terrain database to be compressed small enough to run on existing aircraft computers or even a smartphone. Four, three, two, Fly up left. One, zero. Terminate. This allowed an aircraft to know its exact position relative to the ground in real time and interface with an autopilot that may take control of the aircraft should the pilot be unable to for any reason. With its fly-by-wire system and low cost, Droid 2 was a perfect candidate for these dangerous tests. Pilots deliberately placed Droid 2 on a collision course with a mountain peak, relying on the system alone to detect the imminent impact and take control. In the end, the system proved that it could react quicker than a human pilot, take control, and maneuver the aircraft out of harm's way. We had a fellow come up from Aviation Week and Space Technology, and, uh, and he came out with us one day. We decided that while the aircraft was uh, in the local vicinity flying and we were uh, getting ready to transition to a new set of cards, uh, we put him in the, um, the seat so that he could fly droid around. He was doing pretty well at first, but uh, I looked at the display and the aircraft was pointed straight towards the ground. And I looked at um, what the uh, journalist was doing in the seat and he had full right deflection and uh, full left rudder. <laughs> and so the plane departed flight. The uh, engineer who was uh, staffing one of the stations uh, saw what was happening and he flipped on auto GCAS just because it was just a gut reaction and sure enough uh, we had a fly up and and the aircraft was saved by auto GCAS so uh, that's the first save of uh, uh, of a subscale aircraft and thank God because uh, Droid 2 was uh, able to fly another day and, and many, many more hours. Upon being integrated into piloted aircraft, the Auto GCAS system successfully reduced the leading cause of F-16 pilot fatalities. In 2018, the team was awarded the Collier Trophy, and in 2019, the system began integration into the F-35 fleet. Two recover. Two recover. 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 To date, more than a dozen saved lives have been credited to this technology. Partially developed and tested on a model aircraft. If ever there was a program that underscored the value of subscale flight test, this was it. Very unique um, test opportunity and, uh, uh, you know, uh, significant results. Uh, that will continue to be widely available for um, high-performance vehicles in the future and hopefully at some point for uh, general aviation. Not all ideas are new, however. In some cases, old ideas are revisited. Such is the case with the Prantl series of aircraft. In 1918, German fluid dynamicist Ludwig Prantl, along with others, developed the first mathematical model to predict the lift of a wing. Prandtl comes up with this idea of how to figure out what fluid mechanics is doing. And the math describes what he calls the lifting line. You condense everything that the aerodynamics does to a single line. Once you, of course, have this tool, this lifting line, you can then do optimization. So this is what Prandtl ends up doing, is he takes this lifting line and he can calculate what the induced drag is from one wing tip to the other. 
And so what he ends up with is the amount of energy that's left in the flow after the wing flies through the air. That this minimum amount of energy that's left behind the wing is called the elliptical span load. It's all yours. It knows up a bit. Retired Armstrong yep. chief scientist Albion Bowers had long wrestled with the notion that flying wing aircraft, take me with you, although attractive on the surface, were very difficult to design and control. Bowers designed and the model shop built an all-flying wing aircraft with a bell-shaped lift distribution without a vertical tail to test the theory. What happens here is the wing is now riding on this, this upwash. So now, instead of having drag, you actually have thrust at the wingtips. And something else that's funny that happens is as you create more lift when you deflect the control surface in order to be able to bank the aircraft, um, you end up with this greater thrust at that tip as you create the more lift. So this is the, as you roll, you end up yawing in the correct direction. The roll and the yaw are in the correct direction. This is actually the secret of how birds fly. Initial flight tests showed that it flew very well and gathered the first flight data demonstrating proverse yaw, rolling and yawing in coordinated flight. We got Proverse Yaw. Eventually, more than two dozen aircraft were built, ranging in span from 13 inches to 25 feet. They gathered data not only to prove the bell-shaped lift distribution theory, but also to unlock the secret as to why birds don't have vertical tails. A design that one day could be the first fixed-wing aircraft to fly on Mars. Wouldn't it be cool if you could actually like roll one of these up or, or fold it up and send it to Mars? Three, two, one, release. In the process of landing a rover, you simply throw this thing out as you're coming down close to the surface. And while the rover is landing, this little device could go out and gather data and fly around on Mars. All right, here we go, guys. Turn for takeoff. Today, the Dale Reed Subscale Flight Research Laboratory continues to provide high quality flight tests on a smaller scale. Nose down a little more. There we go. Yeah. There you go. Come on back. Okay, now, I'm, now I'm going to overrun you, so I'm released. Here comes a flap check. It supports a great number of projects at any one time maintaining a wide variety of fixed-wing and multi-rotor aircraft. With its ability to go from initial concept to finished test aircraft, the model shop is a unique group, steeped in more than 75 years of Armstrong Flight Research Center's flight test tradition. Prop. We're prop. The lab is, has embraced the technology and the capability and we're keeping step with the needs uh, of the center and, uh, and NASA is, uh, as an uh, administration as well. We're here uh, doing leading edge technology and uh, I see a bright future for the lab in the future.